Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of today's lecture is benign lymphocytic lesions. In this topic, we are going to cover several diverse and different uh, type of disorders, which are both related to B as well as T lymphocytes, and sometimes a mixture of the two. Pseudolymphomas. The pseudolymphomas are benign, but persistent lymphoid proliferation in the derms, which may very rarely transform to true lymphomas. So in real sense, these are not lymphomas, but just the lymphoid proliferations, which look like lymphomas. Confusion between pseudolymphomas and true lymphomas can easily arise if biopsy is submitted without an adequate history of recent events such as the drug ingestion or scabies. So the pseudolymphomas usually are initiated as a result of some um, uh, pathology like drugs, scabies, insect bites, etc. Etiology. As the adverse drug reactions, for example, the anticonvulsants, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, cytotoxics, anti-rheumatics, antibiotics, and antidepressants. All of them can cause a skin reaction that can lead to formation of pseudolymphomas. Then persistent nodular scabies and arthroboid reaction. So most of the nodular scabies uh, histologically uh, gives an impression of pseudolymphomas. Then retain foreign material like a silicon breast implant, tattoos, vaccination areas, and aquapuncture, persistent contact dermatitis, actinic reticuloid may very rarely actually progress to true lymphomas. Jessner's lymphocytic infiltrate is also is, may also be considered as a form of pseudolymphoma. Then B cell pseudolymphomas may arise in the course of Lyme's disease with Borrelia burgdorferi infection. Clinical features. Both T and B cell pseudolymphomas may present as multiple cutaneous nodules. Uh, the, the first and foremost clinical appearance of any pseudolymphoma is an erythematous papule or nodule. Can be single, can be multiple. T cell pseudolymphomas may also present as persistent erythema that may develop into exfoliative erythroderma, characteristically caused by drugs or contact dermatitis. Since the T lymphocytes have a tendency to invade the epidermis, so in T cell pseudolymphomas, there can be some epidermal involvement with scaling and erythema. But B cell lymphoma, pseudolymphomas, uh, usually present as erythematous nodules, and they may, they may uh, be associated with uh, regional lymph adenopathy. That I would add to the diagnostic confusion between a true lymphoma and a pseudolymphoma. Pathology. <clears throat> the differentiation between a lymphoma and pseudolymphoma um, is resolved by histopathological examination of the lesion. And the salient feature of a pseudolymphoma is presence of both T and B lymphocytes within the proliferate in 50-50 or in, uh, in almost equal proportions. This is not true in case of a true lymphoma because a true lymphoma will be either T lymphoma or a B cell lymphoma. So a mixture of both T and B cells present in a histopathological specimen would lead to the diagnosis of pseudolymphoma rather than a true lymphoma. In a pseudolymphoma, there can be subtle nuclear atypia. T cell pseudolymphomas may present as band-like distribution of lymphocytes along the dermoepidermal junction but do not show frank epidermotropism or portrier microabscesses. 
Basal pseudal lymphomas are usually nodular. Germinal, germinal center formation is usually absent. When present, BCL2 is not expressed. So if a germinal center is seen in a pseudal lymphoma, then it is BCL2 negative. T cell receptor, re, receptor gene rearrangement and, and immunoglobulin gene analysis show usually the evidence of polyclonal proliferation of B and T lymphocytes. The management. The presumed cause should be removed if possible, and it may take weeks or even months for cutaneous lesions to subside even after removal of the initiating cause. In case of symptomatic itch, application of topical corticosteroids um, mid potency or strong potency will accelerate the clearance of the lesion. Petriasis lichenoides. It is a very important disease and comes in the differential diagnosis of many. It is also uh, known as the Mucha Huberman disease. Clinically, petriasis lichenoides is divided into two main conditions. The petriasis lichenoides chronica, abbreviated as PLC, and petriasis lichenoides et veriliformis acuta, abbreviated as PLEVA. The third much rare and aggressive form is the, fibr uh, is the febrile ulceronecrotic Mucha Huberman disease, abbreviated as FUMHD. Despite their names, the distinction between PLC and PLEVA is based on clinical morphology and histology rather than the course of disease as both conditions last for an average of about 18 months with an episodic course. So once the patient develops PLC or PLEVA, you can expect a long course of the disease with frequent remissions and exacerbations. PLC is the common type occurring largely in children and young adults with slight male predominance. All types of uh, petriasis lichenoides are rare in infancy and old age. So extremes of ages are usually spared from this disease. Some patients may have simultaneous lesions of both PLC and PLEVA. So although the PLC and PLEVA lesions are not, um, are, are not uh, though, are, are not such that they evolve into one or other, but uh, since both of the two diseases are very closely related, so it is not very unusual to find the lesions of both PLC and PLEVA in a single patient. The fibroulceronecrotic Mucha Huberman disease occur in isolation, but can evolve from PLC or PLEVA. With a strong male predominance, and most cases occurring in second to third decades. Etiology and pathogenesis. Nosologically, petrosis lacunoides has been considered to be a variant of parasoriasis and show an overlap with lymphomatoid papillosis. We are going to discuss both these diseases subsequently. Pleva has also been reported with associated lymphoma. There are seasonal peaks uh, and the onset is usually in autumn and winter months and rare familial outbreaks also occur. And all these suggest an infective etiology, which include infections like toxoplasma, cytomegalovirus, parvovirus B19, adenovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, herpes simplex virus, varicella zoster virus, HIV, measles, MMR vaccination, and bacteria like streptococci, staphylococci, and mycoplasma. Other reported triggers include medications like chemotherapeutic agents, oral contraceptives, estimazole, and possibly herbal medications. Pleva. The disease starts with constitutional symptoms such as fever, 
headache, malaise, and arthralgias. So prodromal or constitutional symptoms are usually hallmarked uh, with the start of cleva. The eruption develops in crops and consequently appears polymorphic. So the lesions um, occur, they get uh, treated, and then they recur. So that's why the lesions are present in different stages of evolution and look like polymorphic like uh, we see in chickenpox. However, pleva has a long course in chickenpox, as you all know, has a short course. The initial lesion is an edematous pink papule that undergoes central vesiculation and hemorrhagic necrosis, which can be intense. This is also a difference between chickenpox and pleva because chickenpox lesions are never papular. So they will start, the chickenpox lesions will start as vesicles and later on turn pustular. But in pleva, the lesions start as a papule and later on become um, vesicular, later on develop vesiculation and ulceration. The eruption may appear frankly bullous. So this is how the lesion start as erythematous papule and crusted lesions can present anywhere, mainly on the trunk. And as the lesions evolve, the necrotic crust develop in, in the middle of these lesions, followed by ulceration. New lesions may cause irritation or burning sensation as they appear, but often they are asymptomatic. The trunk, thighs, upper arms, especially the flexural aspects, are chiefly affected, but eruption can be generalized. The lesions on palm and soles are less common, and face and scalp are often spared. <clears throat> so lesions on face, in case of pleva, um, in lesions on the face, which look like pleva, will be more likely due to other causes like chickenpox or hydroa vaccinifomy rather than pleva. Erythematous or necrotic lesion of mucous membrane may be present, although this is not very common, as common as chickenpox. Uh, so lesions heal with verily formed scarring, that is chickenpox-like scarring. Then fibroulceronecrotic mucha Huberman disease. I've already told you it's a very rare diagnosis and it presents as acute ulceronecrotic form with high-grade fever, large necrotic lesions, and new crops which continuously develop uh, regularly for many months. About 50 to 75% of the cases occur in adults with a fulminating course that can be fatal. There are raised serological markers like ESR and C-reactive protein in this case. Petrisis lichenoides chronicus. This is characterized by a small firm lichenoid papules, three to 10 millimeter in diameter and reddish brown in color. An adherent mica-like scale can be detached by gentle scraping to reveal a shining brown surface. There will be no auspice sign and the scale is different from scale of gutted psoriasis. That is, the scale is not as thick and uh, silvery as of gutted psoriasis. And when you try to remove the scale, the scale will be removed in total rather than, uh, rather than getting exfoliative and falling in pieces, the scale will come out as a whole. Over the course of three to four weeks, the papule flatten and the scale separates spontaneously to leave pigmented macule which gradually fades. So there is no scarring in case of PLC. The, uh, the lesions can heal uh, only by post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. These are the typical papillo squamous lesions with covered by mica-like scale so PLC comes in the differential diagnosis of papillary squamous lesions, chiefly which are the gutted psoriasis and pyrosia. The course of petrisis lichenoides varies. If the onset is acute, new crops may cease to develop after a few weeks, and many cases are clear within six months. 
or if it does not happen, then the lesions, the disease enter into chronicity in which the lesions may persist for more than a year. In general, the immediate prognosis said to be better when the onset is acute and lesions are occurring in successive crops. So such lesions are bound to get healed more easily and quickly. Now we are going to discuss the histopathological appearances of both PLC and Intriva. So the, uh, the first and foremost appearance, if we see from the top to bottom of a skin uh, lesion, will be the presence of focal areas of parakeratosis. You can see the retention of nuclei in stratum corneum in these, this case. Along with this uh, focal parakeratosis, there is underlying acanthosis. Now this uh, parakeratosis is more highlighted in these images in which you can see these lens-shaped parakeratotic columns here as well as here. And some lymphocytic peppering is seen and the interface change. So uh, presence of parakeratosis in a focal distribution with the interface change is a characteristic pathology of Petriasis lichenoides chronicus. You can see here the basal cell hydropic degeneration as well as red blood cell extravasation. So underlying the parakeratotic columns, there will be the interface change and basal cell vacuolar degeneration. Uh, again, you can see uh, basal cell degeneration, uh, RBC extravasation and lymphocytic uh, extravasation inside the epidermis. Pleva. Uh, in Pleva, uh, since the lesions are, uh, as I've already told you, uh, develop into necrotic bases and later on ulceration, if we do a histology on a Pleva lesion, there will be uh, full thickness or partial thickness, epidermal necrosis, and sometimes ulceration. So this is the, uh, in addition to that, uh, the fibrinoid necrosis of blood vessel walls in the dermis is also seen. So. Uh, the, the difference of histopathology between PLC and PLEVA is mainly the acuteness of the lesion and the necrosis which we see in the epidermis. So necrosis is seen in the lesions of PLEVA and is not seen in lesions of PLC. However, the basal cell degeneration and uh, pigmentary incontinence RBC extravasation is seen in both. Fibrinoid necrosis of the vessels in underlying dermis is also seen in PLEVA and not seen in PLC. The differential diagnosis. The acute vesicular form must be distinguished from chickenpox. Acute necrotic lesions are confused with vasculitis and pyoderma gangrenosum, especially if the necrotic lesions are bigger. Lymphomatoid papillosis is, particular, is particularly difficult differential diagnosis in patients with necrotic lesion uh, in view of its histological similarities. PLC must be differentiated from cutate psoriasis, lichen pannus, and pyrosia. The acral form of PLC in particular may mimic psoriasis and secondary syphilis. Secondary syphilis must be added among the differential diagnosis. The genetic cross syndrome, insect bite, drug eruptions should be included in differential diagnosis, although um, in none of these conditions, there will be a necrotic lesions. Management. Topical corticosteroids may improve the symptoms and healing of the lesions, but do, do not alter the course of the disease. There are some reports of disease clearance with topical tacrolimus ointment. So both these two topical treatments are good for the uh, time management of the disease, but these uh, topical uh, treatments are not going to stop the further uh, recurrences of the disease. In adult, phototherapy is usually the first line treatment of choice and includes both the natural sunlight, UVB, broadband or narrowband UVB, UVA1 and PUVA. Responses are also reported with addition of acitritin to PUVA that is repuva therapy in refractory DS cases. In children, 
since infections are considered to be one of the etiologies, so we can consider giving tetracyclines or erythromycin. Erythromycin is preferred in children because of uh, the chances of dental pigmentation with tetracyclines. In more aggressive and refractory disease of PLEVA or uh, FUMHD, immunosuppressive agents like methotrexate, cyclosporin, dapsone, and intravenous immunoglobulins may prove successful and prevent the fatal loss. Elevated levels of serum tumor necrotic factor alpha in patients with uh, fibro, uh, fibrile ulceronecrotic mucha Huberman disease results in successful use of anti-tumor necrotic alpha inhibitors in a small number of patients. However, the confusion here is that infliximab and adalimumab may also by themselves initiate petriasis lichenoides. So these drugs must be reserved in difficult and refractory cases. The treatment letter for PLC, first line will be topical corticosteroids or tacrolimus. Second line in adults is phototherapy or antibiotics like tetracycline or erythromycin. Second line in children will be um, antibiotics, uh, preferably erythromycin. Then third line in adults include acitretin, plus Pluva, methotrexate, cyclosporin, dapsone, or UVA1. While third line in children include methotrexate, cyclosporin, and dapsone. Treatment letter for PLC, Pleva. First line is oral antibiotics, uh, usually erythromycin, not going to a topical corticosteroid as first line therapy. So in cases, cases of Pleva, you should start with oral antibiotics and uh, second line in adults is phototherapy or acitretin plus phototherapy, while second line in children is phototherapy. Third line in adults is addition of systemic corticosteroids, methotrexate, cyclosporin, or UVA1 therapy, while third line therapy in children would be again systemic corticosteroids, methotrexate, cyclosporin, and dapsone. Now, the third disease we are going to discuss today is a very important one, that is lymphomatoid papillosis. Lymphomatoid papillosis is a chronic, self-healing, rhythmical, paradoxical, papillonecrotic lesion. So there are many adjectives in this definition. Number one, it's chronic disease. Number two, it's a self-healing. That is, every phase of lymphomatoid papillosis heals by itself. So it should not be considered as a lymphoma. Rhythmical, that is, the lesions come and go paradoxical, uh, that is they occur without any, uh, uh, without any prediction and the lesions are papillonecrotic. And in, another, another interesting fact about lymphomatoid papillosis is that histologically they are malignant, but clinically they are benign. And there is unknown etiology. It is generally accepted as a pre-malignant condition with 10 to 19% of patients eventually progressing to lymphoma, which include CD30 uh, positive large cell uh, MF or Hodgkin lymphoma. Male-female ratio is two ratio one, and it is mainly seen in fifth decade. So another difference between the uh, clinically between PLEVA and lymphomatoid papillosis is the age of distribution. PLEVA occur in 20s and 30s, and lymphomatoid papillosis in fifth decade usually, late. So clinical features, affected patients have recurrent crops of papillar and papillonecrotic or nodular lesions predominantly affecting the trunk. So this, and there is another clinical difference here as stated in the statement, that is the lesions may present as nodular lesions. Uh, in PLEVA, we are not expecting nodular lesions. We see nodular ulcerative lesions. So in uh, lymphomatoid papillosis, there will be a nodular ulcerative lesions, but in addition, there will be the nodular lesions as well. The lesions grow rapidly over a few days and develop ulcerated and necrotic centers. Healing occurs slowly over three to 12 weeks with fine atrophic circular or very form scars, but cycle recurs uh, after every few months. So the course is 
more chronic as compared to the course of uh, FIVA. However, the end result is the variliform scarring. So uh, lymphomatoid papillosis will also come in the differential diagnosis of variliform scarring on the trunk. Patient present initially as erythematous papules, which in, which in a course of three to four weeks become hemorrhag hemorrhagic, necrotic, and form a trophic scar. These papules develop on the trunk, forearm, leg, and foot, several lesions in one patient, M multiple small to large papules are present, and later on, the thick necrotic uh, crust and the scar formation is seen within the lesions. Now the histopathology. This is low power view showing ulceration on the top here, covered by granulation tissue with a characteristic wedge shaped in lymphocytic infiltrate within the dermis. The dense dermal infiltrate, even at this magnification, it is obvious that there is a lot of cytological atypia as cells are not of uniform shape. Lymphomatoid papillosis is divided on histological grounds into type A, B, and C subgroups. In A subgroup, there appear to be predominance of scattered, large, strikingly atypical CD30 positive cells, which are similar to the Reed Sternberg cells of Hodgkin's disease. In B group, there are smaller atypical T lymphocytes with convoluted nuclei, similar to what we see in mycosis fungoides, which are predominantly CD3 positive and CD4 positive, but CD30 negative. And there is a C group, which is characterized by large clusters of CD30 positive cells with an overall pattern suggestive of anaplastic CD30 positive large cell lymphoma. So um, the type A and type C is a little similar to each other, but type B is distinct. That is type B is primarily the small T cells, convoluted T cells, while in type A and type C, there will be mainly large cells, which are CD30 positive. So there are some other differences, as you see. Lymphomatoid papillosis pattern A. There are predominant of large cells with marked ATP. As you can see in this field, the cells are quite pleomorphic and nuclear and large, which are hyperchromatic and vesicular mitosis are abundant, but there is no epidermotropism. Lymphocytes have large and irregular hyperchromatic nuclei. Large and irregular, you can see there are several large and irregular hyperchromatic nuclei with prominent nucleoli. There is a background population of neutrophils. These are the neutrophils with multiple lobes and mixed inflammatory cells are also seen. This is probably a distinction between the other frank lymphomas. Multiple mitosis is seen. And if we do immunohistochemistry, these large cells will be CD30 positive. Now, the lymphomatoid papillosis with type B pattern. This is characterized by um, diffuse seeds of small lymphocytes with irregular hyperchromatic nuclei and scanty cytoplasm. But these cells are not as big as you see the lymphocytes in type A pattern. In type B pattern, epidermotropism will be seen and which can be marked and epidermis will be infiltrated by multiple atypical pleomorphic lymphocyte in a band-like distribution. So it is a little different from MF in that in addition to the frank epidermotropism, there will be a dense atypical lymphocytic infiltrate in the dermis as well. Then we come to the pattern C or um, uh, of lymphomatoid papillosis. And here, rather than having a diffuse infiltrate, there will be a nodular infiltrate, which is comprising, uh, which 
is mainly restricted to the dermis and not involving the epidermis or there may be a grand zone. The infiltrate comprising of large sheets of anaplastic cells with vesicular nuclei and prominent nucleoli. There are multiple, uh, there are mul multinucleated tumor cells as well. And the tumor cells are uniformly CD30 positive. Uh, in type A pattern, there will be CD30 positive, but not uniformly positive. But in case of type C pattern, they will be uniformly CD30 positive. Now coming to the treatment. There are individual case reports that suggest that high dose intensive chemotherapy may cause transition to a more aggressive CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorder. Topical or intralegional steroids and topical nitrogen mustards applied to the developing lesions may accelerate its clearance. Narrowband UVB therapy, PUVA, uh, both appear to benefit individual patients. Then low dose methotrexate appears to be the most successful systemic therapy. There are beneficial effects with oral dapsone in some cases. Long-term follow-up is necessary because the risk of progression to more aggressive lymphoma. The prognosis in patients with both MF and lymphomatoid papillosis appears to be excellent. An excellent recent review of 118 patients uh, with, which are followed up for many years suggests that approximately 4% will develop extracutaneous disease within 10 years. So it is not a very frank malignant condition. The next disease we are going to discuss today is parasoresis. Parasoresis is always a confusing term, both clinically as well as histologically. The confusion is because of lack of universally agreed definition. There is unresolved controversy as to whether or not the two of the parasoresis variants are either precursors to cutaneous lymphomas. The majority of cases of a small plaque parasoriasis, uh, in majority of cases, the small plaque parasoriasis is chronic and a benign condition. In cases of large plaque parasoriasis, there is more evidence that at least some cases from the outset are a form of mycosis fontoides. So a tilt towards MF is more in large plaque parasoriasis rather than a small one. Unfortunately, T-cell receptor gene rearrangement studies have never been conclusive. So small plaque parasoriasis, which is also called as the chronic superficial dermatitis or digitate dermatosis, show digitate erythematous lesion with cigarette paper scales on limb and trunk. So small plaque psoriasis comes in the differential diagnosis of digitate dermatosis which are caused, which the other causes are shitagoki um, uh, mushrooms, then um, by bleomarsin and irritant contact dermatitis or phytophoto contact dermatitis. The, uh, uh, these small plaque parasoriasis lesions are commonly seen in middle-aged men and persist for years, and they do not progress to mycosis fungoides. The histology is non-specific. There are two main features, that is the parakeratosis, which we see in stratum corneum, and then acanthosis, and mild thoraciform hyperplasia. There will be mild to moderate perivascular lymphohistocytic infiltrate in the dermis. So there will be no frank uh, hyperplasia. There will be no Monroe microabscesses or a spongiform pustule of the bulge. Can be spongiosis and infiltrates consist of lymphocytes and histocytes, but there will be no ATP. The infiltrate, if we get, get the immunohistochemistry done, then they are mainly CD4 positive T helper cells. So small plaque psoriasis, uh, little treatment is needed. Emollients are usually sufficient to control the uh, condition. UVB therapy may result in temporary clearance, but recurrence is, is invariable. 
large black psoriasis, para psoriasis, or para keratosis variegata, or poikilodermatous para psoriasis. So these are the other names for large plaque para psoriasis. It is a chronic condition that is characterized by presence of fixed large atrophic erythematous plaques, usually on trunk and occasionally on limb. So the word atrophic here in this definition is very um, is very important because this is actually the differentiation of these lesions from the lesions of eczema or psoriasis. So the lesions are erythematous, but there will be a slight atrophy as we see in lesions of mycosis fungoides as well. Patches and plaques may show striking polymorphism and poikiloderma. With slow progression, 11% of the cases may turn into mycosis fungoides. So even if the biopsy does not prove it to be mycosis fungoides, these cases should be followed and rebiopsy is done after every three to six months. The histology is not diagnostic for MF and most biopsies would show only mild dermatitis. Immunophenotypic studies reveal a normal T-cell phenotype and T-cell rearrangement studies have shown clonal T-cell proliferation. Treatment is by topical emollients, UVB, PUVA. Topical corticosteroids are used with caution because of chances of getting atrophy further. So it's better to dilute it with some emollients or use it uh, episodically. Jessner's lymphocytic infiltrate. It is a chronic benign T-cell lymphoproliferative disorder usually on exposed areas of the skin. Female are more affected than male. The lesions develop spontaneously and involute spontaneously, but many a times it is persistent and it has the winter exacerbations like we see in other uh, previous dermatoses, which, are, which also have an autumn and winter exacerbations. Lesions are commonly asymptomatic, although some patients complain of burning, uh, burning or pruritus. So you can see multiple erythematous discoid plaques or papules and <clears throat> tendency to persist and relapse. The histology is just a heavy chronic lymphohistocytic infiltrate um, cuffing around the superficial dermal blood vessels. Sometimes perifollicular infiltrate is also seen. Infiltrate is composed and almost entirely of small lymphocytes and lymphoid follicles are usually, uh, lymphoid follicles are not formed. The majority of the cells are CD4 positive and B cells, cells are sparse uh, or totally absent. The treatment is unsatisfactory, but lesion tend to persist and increase in number with time. The individual cases respond to topical steroids, systemic corticosteroids, PUVA radiotherapy, Depsone hydroxychloroquine, and gold. There is no particular aggravation by sunlight. However, since the lesions occur on the face, it is advisable to advise, give patient some broad spectrum sunblocks as well. Although the disease does not have any particular sun aggravating potential. Chronic actinic dermatitis. The, it is a chronic photosensitivity eruption of unknown its pathogenesis, but is usually seen in individuals who are chronically exposed to sunlight like the farmers and people working in uh, inactive daylight. The patient shows sensitivity to both the visible UVA and UVB spectrum of light. It resembles lymphoma clinically as well as histologically. Affects mainly male and in middle age ages. Usually start as eczematous lesions, which later on turn lichenoid and give a typical leonine facings. So uh, the CAD or chronic actinic dermatitis comes in the differential diagnosis of leonine facings. Uh, there are prominent lichenoid papules with patients with atopic dermatitis are more likely to develop actinic reticuloid. 
the chronic actinic dermatitis term is sometimes used interchangeably with actinic reticuloid. But usually actinic reticuloid means that involvement of reticuloendothelial system because induced by sunlight. So actinic reticuloid and actinic, uh, chronic actinic dermatitis are used interchangeably. There is a dense infiltrate uh, which is seen throughout the dermis with evident fibrosis. Infiltrate comprise mainly of lymphocytes and histocytes. Some of the lymphocyte cells are large and atypical, and hence they look more like reticuloendothelial cells. And this term is called, that's why they're called as reticuloid cells. And in addition, they are scattered eosinophils. Um, there is lymphocytic exocytosis, mild cytological atypia. My, Quartier microapsis are not seen. On immunohistochemistry, CD4 positive cells are prominent in early stages and CD8 cells are prominent in the later stages. T cell re gene rearrangement studies um, are usually negative. Treatment is based on light avoidance and uh, use both the titanium dioxide containing physical light barriers or chemical sunblocks uh, like, uh, the, like benzoines and etc. Low dose systemic steroids, cyclosporin, hydroxyurea, and azathioprine are in addition uh, the treatment of choice for uh, different patients. Prognosis for recovery is poor and majority of patients tend to have severe photosensitivity for remaining of the lives. Lymphocytoma cutis or cutaneous B cell pseudolymphoma. Lymphocytoma cutis is a benign cutaneous B cell lymphoproliferative condition present as plum colored or bluish nodules or plaques on face, chest and upper extremities. It pursues a chronic course and female male ratio is three to one. In younger patients, white more than black, that is nine ratio one. It is cutaneous B-cell lymphoma, a large nodule, uh, usually solitary, asymptomatic, persistent, chronic, painful and itchy. Multiple lesions may occur and disseminate and may sometimes seen in all stages of development. Like other B-cell lymphomas, B-cell pseudolymphoma will have a nodular pattern with a top heavy dense dermal nodular infiltrate with conspicuous germinal centers. Interfollicular cellular population consists of lymphocytes, plasma cells, eosinophils and histocytes. So the population will be mixed. Then tangible body macrophages are also seen within the germinal centers. High power view of germinal centers and adjacent population of a small mature lymphocytes. Mitosis is visible but rare. Appendages and blood vessels are spared. On immunohistochemistry, there is an admixture. There is a predominant population of B lymphocytes in the center of these um, um, follicles which are strained with CD20, uh, CD20, while T cells are seen mainly at the periphery, or periphery of the follicles, and these take up CD3 stain. The follicular arrangement will be highlighted by ordering CD21 immunohistochemistry strain. If we do the kappa and lambda chains, then it is mainly the kappa chain, uh, the, it is a polyclonal, and uh, both kappa and lambda chains are seen. Treatment, there is no treatment of proven value. Penicillins and radiotherapy have been used both. Interlegional corticosteroids have been advocated, uh, especially in uh, a few lesions. Millary lesions may respond to topical corticosteroids and hydroxychloroquine. Prognosis, long-term follow-up, these patients suggest that a small proportion progress to cutaneous B-cell lymphoma and therefore prognosis must be guarded. The last of today's layer is the leukemia cutis. The leukemia cutis implies infiltration of skin by frank leukemic white cells. These are the metastatic skin lesions and due to some form of leukemia, but the most common is myelomonocytic leukemia and T-cell poly uh, T-cell poly, um, 
morphocytic liquid. This is a rarely encountered pathology, side effect, or, or metastasis, and it is associated with poor prognosis because it is a skin metastasis. And majority of patients die within one year. Leukemia cutis the legend appears as papules and nodules. Ulceration is maybe seen, mainly seen on the ankles, but develop at other sites. There is heavy dermal infiltrate with predominant dissection of collagen by the acute uh, leukemia cells. And the blast cells have dark nuclei with minimal cytoplasm. And immunohistochemistry will be CD34 positive, CD45 positive, CD117 positive. All of these are the myelomonocytic markers. Diagnosis of these conditions is based on pathological examination and examination of blood, bone marrow, and lymph nodes and the skin. Treatment of leukemia cutis is mainly the management of underlying disease with symptomatic measures for skin lesions when required. Radiotherapy is, some, is useful and it uh, results in regression of cutaneous lesions. So I thank you all and I hope that this difficult topic is uh, understandable to you after this uh, lecture. Hope to see you next week with another edition of my lecture. Thank you and goodbye.